Christopher Trafford! What's up, guys, and welcome to episode two of Chris's podcast, where I'm going to be going into UFC 282 and the aftermath, and a little bit about what has been going on in my life since I last tuned in here. So, I had a pretty good week. I went to jujitsu three times. Got bodied the first time by this white belt, but he's a wrestler, so he's really more advanced than his belt would otherwise insinuate. He got me in a bunch of arm bars, like two or three while we were live rolling. But that's something I could easily fix. Advanced belts, they don't usually get arm barred. Usually you'll have T-Rex arms keeping your arms tight. So I'll remember that going forward. Took a year off jujitsu because I ran the marathon this year. I ran the New York City Marathon. So I'm still coming back. It's an entirely different type of cardio, by the way. To be able to run 26.2 miles, you have to run at a slow and steady and controlled pace for four or five hours. Jiu-Jitsu is a lot more explosive, even if you're not supposed to be using your strength. They complement each other. If you want to explode out of someone's side control and shoulder bridge, that requires a lot of energy. So, was ill prepared to fight that wrestler. I lived to fight another day. Learned from that experience. And then my other two times, I, each of those times, secured an armbar, or Americanas. So, maybe that'll be my signature move. Just kidding. Um, they were against early white belts. So, it's remarkable, just me being a three straight white belt, the difference between the skills that I have and someone that's just walking into jujitsu. It's really incredible. I started going to jujitsu for that reason. So, as you guys remember from last week, if you tuned in, I come from the Army. So, I was in the Army for seven years. And that was my community, that was my life, those were my friends. But when I got out of the Army and I went to law school, I moved to New York City, and I had to find a whole nother community and family. As it turns out, Hendo Gracie is the place for me, that's where I found it, and it was sheer luck. So back in 2018, there was this video making the rounds of Matt Sarah holding down this drunk guy, and I thought, I should have some type of martial arts experience just for dealing with somebody on the subway or in any other situation where in New York trouble is always just around the corner. So I ended up Googling jiu-jitsu academies near me, and I found Henzo Gracie's. Didn't know anything about the prestige of that academy or the Gracie name. Maybe a little bit about the Gracie name, but not Henzo in particular or all of his other black belts. So in 2018, I just walked in and fell in love with Jiu Jitsu right away. I found my community there and developed skills where I can just feel comfortable walking around if there's drunk guy like causing a mess like in Matt Sarah's situation I could handle that situation now I feel comfor- com- comfortable in that I feel like I felt comfortable that I could do that before jujitsu but it's amazing when you actually train martial arts how little you knew before and you would think oh man I was a tough guy back then <laughs> but I would have just gotten wrecked by someone that knows what they're doing especially jiu-jitsu. If you don't know anything about jiu-jitsu, it's hard to 
defend yourself against somebody. Which is just what the jujitsu did in its early days. When it was founded, Grandmaster Helio, I think he was like 5'2 or 5'3. He just would beat opponents much bigger than him, and he was small and skinny and frail because no one knew what jujitsu was. They couldn't defend against rear naked chokes or arm locks or shoulder locks. They didn't know what those were. <laughs> it's crazy how far we've came. Look at the early UFCs. The Gracies founded the UFC, by the way, in 1993. And before they founded it, they used to put on events. They would take out ads in the newspaper or Playboy, like in early 90s and late 80s, challenging anyone to fight in no holds barred match for, I don't know what the reward was, like 50,000, let's say. And the Gracies would win, inevitably, every fight. Because no one knew what jujitsu was. Back then it was just powerlifting and kumite and <laughs> blood sport and all these secret techniques. But jujitsu proved itself to be the real deal. I mean, UFC won, two, four. I think Hoist won them all, and he used... I think like six foot, like 170, fighting against what would be heavyweights. Look at his early fights against Frank Shamrock, shooto fighter, legend of the sport, and WWE. Action figure of a man. He didn't know what jiu jitsu was. Royce would beat him. But now people know what jiu jitsu is. <laughs> so. If you have a strong base in jiu-jitsu, it can get you pretty far, but if someone knows what they're doing, they can defend against a lot of basic jiu-jitsu techniques. Like me in my training, when I always get beat up. So, yeah, jiu-jitsu was good. I went three times this week. On Wednesday, I went to a cro mag show, and I hung out backstage with the band. The singer Harley is actually a jujitsu black belt under, you guessed it, Henzo freaking Gracie. That was incredible. I actually work with this person who is best friends with Harley Flanagan's wife. And I went to a work event this summer I'm a lawyer, and there was like a company retreat at the managing partner's house out in the Hamptons. Huge house. Hung out at his country club, and then had a lobster bake on his front yard. It was awesome. But yeah, driving out there, I was with this woman. And she was saying how her best friend's husband is in this band, and I'm a musician. I grew up playing music as my passion, like guitar and bass, and can keep a, a beat on drums. So I said, who is it? And then she said, no, you wouldn't know. I said, no, come on, I love music, who is it? She said, the Cro-Mags. I don't know if you know who the Cro-Mags are, you probably don't, but if you do, that name has a lot of significance. The Cro-Mags. They are legends in New York and in the hardcore punk scene generally. Harley is having a documentary finished on him now, like a big documentary. They were wrapping up filming at the show I was at. If you look at interviews from like established artists like Dave Grohl, one of his biggest influences is the Cro-Mags and Harley. He's kind of like your favorite musician's favorite musician. They have such a cult, legendary following in some circles. So I was blown away by seeing that. So I go backstage and I say, hey, I'm a Henzo guy. Right away, right away we, we hit it off. He was telling me how he was even Henzo's, in Henzo's first group of students before Matt Sarah, who is, as we know, 
and the first American black belt in jiu-jitsu, and he got it from Henzo. And Harley was going before that. I think 96, that is when Henzo Gracie Academy started. Amazing. So when I started going to jiu-jitsu, by the way, I would see him, and uh, he would teach the kids' classes. This, like, tatted up, menacing-looking dude teaching the kids' classes on the front end of the crow mags. <sighs> Little did I know how important these people were. I probably appreciated it, but I appreciate being at Hendo so much more now. After a few years of being around titans of the industry. It used to be John Danaher, Gordon Ryan, Nicky Ryan, Gary Tonin, Nicky Rodriguez. Familiar with these names, then you know jujitsu jiu and how they are just taking over the scene. Gordon is the Conor McGregor of jujitsu. I say that in a good way. He's very acclaimed. I believe he won like his like 50 matches in a row or something and set the record for that, and he's still going. Winning Abu Dhabi and, and super matches. That's who I would go up, grow up seeing in my jiu-jitsu journey. Jake Shields would be there all day, and in between classes he would be like sleeping on the mats or reading a book or something, just waiting for the next class. They lived at the gym, all of them. And this was back when I was in law school, so I was able to go to lunchtime jujitsu, like 12 noon on weekdays. And even at that time, his classes would be full, like, I don't know, 60 people in the gym just to hear Donaher and Gordon go over techniques. It's really crazy. UFC fighters would pop in all the time. Awesome, awesome events. Just not events, just, just being there, just seeing these people and how they operate was really special. So yes, I saw the cro show, Harley Flanagan, and worked out at the gym three times this week. Also what I'm doing is I'm trying to lift in the mornings, so I'm supersetting right now. I do a one day chest tries, one day back buys, one day shoulder abs, because those are hard to superset with other muscle groups. If people, people always say that you don't need strength for jujitsu, but come on. In our age, we do. Especially when, you, like I said, you're going against wrestlers. Sometimes you gotta power out, but that's not what they teach you. How's your guys' this week? You guys looking forward to UFC 282 talk? Let's get into it, shall we? So, the UFC held its last numbered event for the year last night, December 10th, in Las Vegas. And that card exceeded expectations. It was it's a going to be a remarkable card for what happened, as we'll discuss some very controversial judge decisions. But after 281, two weeks ago, and then UFC Orlando last week, and all of the fights falling off of the main card, I don't know how high the expectations were for UFC 282, but even if, particularly if they were low expectations, they were exceeded, right? Even with the two crazy judge decisions at the end of it. So, in the lead up to the event, I believe all the fighters made weight, at least all of the featured fighters made weight, which is the first fight, the scales, so that's good. Then we had the press conference, Pretty interesting press conference. For some reason, Patty Pimblett and Ilya Taporia went at it, but they're not even fighting each other. They're both fighting on the main card, but they weren't even fighting each other, and they're in different divisions. 
but Ilya wanted to get at Patty. Patty was cursing and screaming at him. At one point, Ilya even got up from his chair, walked over towards Patty on the other side of the room, had to get held behind him by a security guard. If the UFC wants that fight, uh, the storyline's there now. But as we'll go into, Patty got the decision victory. It was very controversial, though. And Ilya finished the fight and looked very dominant. So I don't know how that fight would go. I don't know if the UFC should match up Ilya versus Patty right now. Maybe Patty needs a ranked opponent, but maybe a lower ranked opponent. So he has some time to learn to get his chin down and avoid making these critical errors at, because when he's at the upper echelon of division, they're going to be fatal flaws. Right now, he's, as we'll go into, surviving them. But who's the champion right now at 55? Islam. If Islam lands on the button I don't, with Patty's chin up, I don't know if that fight's going to go go to distance. Patty's got some work to do. So that was the press conference. Going into the fight, the main card, the main event had to get reworked. So as we remember, it was supposed to be Yuri Brohaska versus Glover Teixeira. A rematch of what many people are going to be considering fight of the year. Unfortunately, Yuri hurt his shoulder very bad. Dana said it was the worst shoulder injury that one could have, requiring at least a year, nine months, a year recovery before even training again, I think. So... What Yuri did was relinquish the belt. He's a true warrior. That shows the true samurai spirit. He doesn't want to not defend the belt, so he prefers to give it up and let the competitors fight for it. I commend that. So what the UFC did was offer Glover the chance to fight on Goliath and Glover turned the fight down. Just because he needed more time. It's a short notice title fight. So he wanted to fight in Rio. Hio. In January, at the UFC's next numbered card next year. But Dana White said no. Dana White even took Glover off the card. Left a voicemail for Jan Blachowicz, who was flying from Poland to Vegas saying, hey, you're going to go fight for the championship. You're, fight, you're fighting Ankolaev. Jan Blachowicz didn't even know <laughs> about that fortunate turning of, of events until he landed. How, how awesome is that? So we ended up having a new main event. Jan Blachowicz versus Ma- Magomed Ankolaev. Went to a decision, and as we'll talk about, a very controversial split draw. Both controversial in how the judges scored it and controversial in how the UFC is addressing the situation. So let's break it down. In the first three rounds, Jan was having his way against Ankalaev. Ankalaev is an established wrestler. He's a Dagestani. But this was a striking match a kickboxing match for the first three rounds. For whatever reason, Ankalaev's strategy was to stand up instead of utilize his strength, his wrestling. And Jan was chopping away at Ankalaev's legs. His lead leg got so busted up that Ankalaev had to turn into southpaw, have a different lead leg because he couldn't expose his right leg to any further damage. So then Jan started chipping away at the left leg. And by round three, it got so bad that Ankalaev was actually limping, showing 
showing pain that he couldn't even put his weight on his foot. I can only imagine how much that must have hurt. But, end of round three, he changed the game plan up. He made his adjustments. That's what champions do. He got a late round three takedown. But in round four and round five, went wrestling early and controlled Jan throughout. So, goes to decision, and in the lightweight championship of the world, goes to a split draw. How does that happen? So the judge that ruled it a draw had the first three rounds for Jan, and the last two rounds for Ankalaev, but the fifth round being a 10-8. And then one judge had it for Jan, I presume rounds one through three. And then the second judge had it for Ankalaev, I presume rounds three through five. But we had the 10 8. So it was a majority split draw. Crazy. I mean, the belt's on the line. Now it's going to sit vacant for even longer. How do you think the UFC addressed that situation? Guess. Did you guess have totally new fighters for another UFC light heavyweight competition? And don't give John, Jan, or Magomed the chance to compete again? I didn't choose that. Especially because in the post-fight interviews that Joe Rogan was doing after the judges made their decision, everyone was clear who won. Magomed Ankalaev won. Jan even said, give the belt to Ankalaev. Ankalaev was so frustrated at the decision, he even said in his post-fight interview that he doesn't want to fight in the UFC anymore. It turns out that that might have been a little bit of a translation error because apparently he does still want to fight for the UFC, but not in Vegas because of this decision. The UFC doesn't control who the judges are. That's the athletic commissions. So... If he did not even fight for the UFC, as long as he fought in Nevada, in Las Vegas, he would be subject to the same type of judging. In any case, wasn't a good look saying, I don't want to fight for the UFC anymore after that decision, when the UFC had no control in that judge's split draw decision. I believe it was Sal D'Amato. Regardless what Dana White decided to do, to rectify the situation is to have Glover Teixeira get a chance to fight for the belt against Jamal Sweet Dreams Hill. What about Ankalaev, who's like the boogeyman of the d division, who arguably should be the champ right now? They went for two totally new fighters inexplicably. I can understand not giving Jan another chance. Even though it was a draw, he particularly said, hey, I lost the fight. But why punish Ankalaev, who people by all accounts think he's next in line to be the light heavyweight champion? You can't fault him for a faulty judge decision. Unreal. An ending to 282. A split draw. Kind of sullied an otherwise awesome card. As did the co main Patty Pimblett versus Jared Jordan. Luckily, besides that, it was an awesome night. I believe 10 of 12 fights were finishes. 
the only two that went to judge's decision were these two crazy results. Even in the early prelim, it was great fights. So, Patty gets a unanimous decision after three rounds in what people are calling one of the most controversial results in recent memory. People are sharing a post right now of, I don't know, 30 of the major publications and who they thought won the fight. Out of the 30, one of them had it for Patty. 29 of them had it for Gordon. Even the commentators thought that Gordon won. It turns out that that judge that scored it for Patty didn't have a good week. On Friday at the Bellator Championships, he judged a fight 50 to 45 for a fighter, Danny Sabatello, where Rafion won the fight and kept the belt and had at least three or four rounds from all of the other from the two other judges. So before UFC 282, there was people saying, is this the most unjust result judge card of all time with this 50-45 for Sabatello? And so what happened was that judge flew down to UFC and had himself another awesome night in the office, I'm not going to say his name, and ruled it for Patty. Nothing's going to happen, however. Very rarely do judges have to face accountability for their actions because the athletic commissions are governed by the state government for each state. So if we wanted to even hold this judge accountable, we'd have to go through the governmental process. I don't know. We'd have to write our elected officials or something. Something's got to happen, though. There needs to be a way to have judges be held accountable. Don't you feel bad for the fighters? If they lose, they lose half their pay. And it's one thing to lose a fight, but to lose it to the judges when everyone thinks you won the fight? This one judge rules against you? Who, by the way, is subject to scrutiny for the previous night having what people are saying one of the worst calls of all time. There's even talk of the C word, corruption, or being rigged. Don't you think the UFC, who is all about protecting the brand and having the most integrity, should figure out with the Athletic Commission how to address that? I mean, look what happened with James Krause. They excommunicated him, took away his livelihood for supposedly betting on fights. Well, he was betting on fights, but after they outlawed betting on fights, there was a wonky result with one of his fighters. So insider trading is a word that we use on Wall Street, but perhaps Krauss had some material non-public information that his fighter was hurt and was going to fight anyway and probably lose, and a lot of people placed money on the opponent. They banned him from the sport. They banned any fighter who is coached by him from the sport. And they banned everybody who trains at the gym from his sport. Why isn't there that same type of urgency when it comes to fighting and judge decisions? The hammer can move swiftly if there is enough press behind it. 
as shown by James Cross situation. But oftentimes the outrage isn't enough. We have plenty of bad decisions. Let's hope that it's not the C word that plagues boxing, corruption, or something else. In a lot of ways, as far as UFC has advanced, we're still in the we're still in the wild, wild west. It's crazy. This sport has birthed and developed to one of the biggest sports in the world in our lifetimes. In 1993 was the first UFC. And now mixed martial arts is everywhere. Fighters are well-rounded in multiple disciplines. But we're still lagging behind. The, the law is catching up to the sport, which is evolving at a breakneck speed. So bad breaks for Gordon. Let's get into that fight. Now that the judge controversy is out of the way. So that really was a display between sheer power by Gordon, who visibly rocked Patty on multiple occasions, who Patty's fighting with his chin up still. Patty had his moments though. He would go in, kind of blitz like a la Wonder Boy, hit combinations. But, man, that was such an unfortunate break for Gordon. It wasn't a super crazy fight where we don't know where any, any judge could have got around for Gordon, but most people had it 29-28 for Gordon, and a strong minority had it 30-27 for Gordon. Before that, we had Santiago Ponzinibbio versus Alex Morono. Uh, Ponzi got it done round three with a TKO, two minutes in. Good to see Ponzi back. He, Alex Morono filled in on short notice for Robbie Lawler, who had to pull out for injury. And so they fought at catch weight. And Ponzi is coming off of a horrific knee injury that sidelined him for over 18 months. So it's good to see Ponzi back back on his quest for the gold and he looked in good form let's continue to see him improve because coming up he was a absolute problem for the division like a boogeyman kind of like Ankalaev is in the light heavyweight division before that we had fight of the night warranted by the way Darren Till versus Drikus Duplessis England versus South Africa. South Africa goes undefeated on the night, 2-0. Two, two and out. So Duplessis gets the round three submission, two minutes, 43 seconds in. And it was a great fight. Um, Duplessis impressed me with his great athleticism and wrestling. Till showed good boxing. Um... But really the story is Duplessis smothering control. Like for early in the first round, Duplessis had Till pushed up against the cage and he was working his clinch game. And Duplessis got control of Till's inside wrist. And then with his outside free hand, delivered probably at least... 60 unanswered punches until had no response for them. Maybe that fight could have ended then, really. But Till was talking to the ref the whole time, showing that he was, while not intelligently defending himself, still has his wits about him, and so the fight continued. But Duplessis had, had that wrist control and delivered so much damage against the cage. In round three, Duplessis gets a takedown, flattens Till out on his back, gets the rear naked choke. People are saying that Till suffered an ACL injury early on in the fight. If that's the case, it's unfortunate. Till suffered, as we know, a lot of injuries throughout his career, even though he's only less than 30. 
So bad break for Till, who had to pull out of his previous fight in UFC London, too, due to injury. So can't catch a break, but at 85, he looked filled out. He looked healthy. Going against Duplessis, though, he really got exposed. In the press conference, Duplessis was very like a gentleman, but he said to Till, hey, I'm not going to be your win back. You need to go back down to uh, 70, to welterweight. Now Till's lost five out of six. Maybe that's the move for him going back down to welterweight. Or perhaps healing up and keeping working in his, his wrestling. I know he fought, he's with Cam's out a lot, and he f trained down in Tiger Muay Thai with a lot of the Dagestani wrestlers, putting in that work. So bad breaks for, for Darren Till. Great win for Duplessis. Before that, we had a fight which people were calling the people's main event of the night. Leading up into the fight, Joe Rogan even said that, you know, this is this could be a future title fight. I would tend to agree with that. And it was Bryce Mitchell versus Ilya Teporia. Someone O had to go, I believe. And Teporia scores the round two submission in three minutes. Three minutes into the second round. Man, Teporia's a problem. He seems so polished. Very powerful with his punches, rocking Bryce. Bryce really was strong, but at one point, he just got outmatched. What happened was they were against the cage. Tapori was doing his clinch work and locked in a standing arm triangle. Like, they weren't standing. They were, like, in between standing and on the ground. I think Bryce might have had one knee down or something. And Toporia locks in a freaking arm triangle while they're off the ground, certainly, and just snaps. Snaps Bryce to the ground. Sinks in the arm triangle and gets Bryce to submit. No easy feat. Bryce Mitchell has amazing jujitsu. So that really just shows just the power of Toporia and his acumen in the combat sports arena. Teporia and Patty got into it a lot in the pre-fight presser. Man, I don't know if Patty would be ready to fight. Toporia now, Patty's a, a big lad, but Teporia's very powerful. I don't know if that's a fight to make. Teporia could theoretically fight Patty. Patty's a money fight these days. But Topori could also move up the featherweight rankings. Interesting matchmaking will be done from this UFC, particularly with Ilya Toporia and Patty, for that matter. So those two opened up the main card, but the prelims and the early prelims were also great. I wrote an article today about Raul Rosas Jr., which will be published shortly on Combat Sports UK, I'll publish it, talking about how Raul Rosas Jr. just became the youngest athlete ever in the UFC. History making, right? It'll be good to see where his career goes. So last night, he secures a round one submission, two minutes and 44 seconds in, at the ripe old age of 18 and 63 days. What were you doing when you were 18 years old and 63 days? I was scraping by, working at Price Shopper, working at a supermarket as a cashier and like cart collector in the parking lot. And this guy is winning UFC fights. There's levels. There's levels, right? He has school on Monday. Luckily, he's homeschooled. It would be an interesting Monday to see all your friends. Probably would skip class. He probably would take Monday off, though. 
he was in school. So Rosas looked like an absolute animal last night. He's 5'9", has a bantamweight, looks just huge for the division, towered over Jay Perrin. He, at one point, lifted Perrin up to slam him down. He's a 10th planet jiu-jitsu guy. Really has strong jiu-jitsu. And so after he flattened him, grabbed the body triangle, made him tap to a rear naked choke. Perrin's 0-3 in the UFC now, but for making her de debut, he's a strong competitor. And re really, Rosa showed a lot. He was hilarious in the post-fight conference with Joe Rogan. He said, give me that 50 G's so I can buy my mom a minivan so she can take me to the PI, the UFC Performance Institute. He did end up getting 50 G's. Dana gave out, I believe, 10 performance awards last night. Usually, he gives out two in a fight of the night. So they were abound last night, rewards. Good to see. UFC taking care of the fighters. Say what you want about the fighter pay, but they do a lot of backdoor bonuses and just give awards like they did last night when they gave out so many performance awards that they do take care of the fighters in a lot of ways. So before that, we had Yarinza Rosenstroik versus Chris Dawkins. Not much to say about that. That fight ended in 23 seconds. Rosenstroik just was all go, no stop from the get-go. Has so much power in his punches. Ended the fight almost immediately. Bad couple weeks for the Dawkins brothers. Kyle Dawkins also lost last weekend at UFC Orlando. Pretty handily, so I feel for them. Hopefully they can take some time off for the holidays since they just each fought. Come back, retool, get stronger. Biggie Boy has some power in his hands, though. Uh, before that, Edmund Shambazian, he scored a round two TKO against Dalcha Lunglambula. Great fight for Shabazian, who's coming off of about a year layoff. Uh, here's a fight I want to get into. Chris Curtis versus Joachim Buckley. So like I said, uh, I was at Chris Curtis's last fight at UFC London when he replaced Jack Hermanson. Or he replaced Darren Till on short notice to fight Jack Hermanson. And at UFC London, Curtis let the nerves get the better of him. So because it was a short notice fight, Hermanson played it very safe. He was circling from the outside, picking his shots carefully, and Curtis couldn't navigate that position, navigate the distance, and by the end of the fight, he was like cursing and throwing the middle finger because he was frustrated. And so last night, Buckley came in with the same type of game plan, and it was working until it wasn't. Buckley was using that same type of Hermanson, Hermanson boxing from the outside to deliver heavy damage. But in round two, Buckley tried to do one of his patented fun knockouts. He went for a head kick, and Curtis countered it with a left hook to his nose. And he sat Buckley down right away. And it ended the fight immediately after. Curtis swarmed on him like a hammer fist to end the fight. Buckley bounced his head off the cage, lost consciousness, came back up. Chris Curtis has that type of power where all it takes is one punch to change the momentum of the fight. Kind of like Bam Bam, tied to a, to a Vasa power in his hands. Or at least he showed it last night. So great win for Chris Curtis. 
Bad breaks for Joachim Buckley. Before that, on the early prelims, such a great card. We had Billy Quarantillo. Let's go. He beat Alexander Hernandez in a featherweight fight. Um, four minutes and 30 seconds into round two. Great win for Billy. Hernandez was actually making his featherweight debut. So he's formerly a lightweight and was big for the division. But in featherweight, huge for the division. He's a wrestler. He has so much mass on him that he can really use his athleticism and impose his will to go a long way with his wrestling. That was on display in the first round last night. Billy was getting beaten so bad that in between rounds, his judges, his uh, coaches rather, were asking Billy what his kid's birthday is to make sure that he was all present. But the second round, talk about a tale of two, sto of two stories, right? I don't know if Hernandez had a bad weight cut or otherwise it didn't replenish himself after that steep cut down to 145. But it seems like he emptied his tank. And Billy Quarantillo, cardio machine that he is, finished the fight. Came on Hernandez hard after he took over and got the round two TKO. Opening the fight, the first fight of the night was Cameron Saman, who scores a round three TKO on Steven Kuslo. That was the other South African fighter who impressed in his debut and took South Africa to 2 0 with the Drigas Duplessis wins. So, everyone down in Safa, awesome night for you guys and awesome night for the fans too, besides those two wonky decision results. That just happened to be for the belt and for one of the UFC's biggest stars, and was the co-main, and the main event of the evening. Bad breaks, but not to spoil a great card besides that. So that's about it. I talked a little bit about what's been going on with my training, and things that happened since last week, and we got into 282 talk. So there's gonna be a lot of ramifications for this event. Let me know what you guys think. Let me know if you have any suggestions for future videos. And as always, I love all your comments and can't appreciate you guys enough. So that's it. Thanks. Bye.